In 1982, UK-based game developer and publisher Richard Shepard Software released Shaken But Not Stirred for the ZX Spectrum. It was a text-based adventure featuring the first ever appearance of James Bond in a video game. Though it was unofficial in its release and definitely not licensed, it actually ended up being pretty good for the time and garnered decent word of mouth with one outlet calling it a quote, fast-moving machine code adventure and another reviewer saying, yeah, I'm just gonna leave that one for you to read. Now we're gonna take a pause right here at the beginning of the video because I know exactly what you're thinking. Kyle, I don't care about text-based video games or the 1980s. No one reads anymore, and the only thing interesting about the 80s, other than Stranger Things, is MTV and the fall of the Soviet Union. Just trust me, keep watching. I know I'm holding you up at gunpoint. It's not a big deal. It's just a prop gun, it costs $70, and I'm not salty about it at all. Also, please go like and subscribe to Subpixel so that we can keep making awesome content that'll make your ear holes and your eyeballs tell your brain that it's super happy. As a gaming franchise, James Bond has seen about as many interpretations of its source material as the movies have. You've got your text-based games, your really bad side-scrollers, your pretty okay side-scrollers, your top-down driving sims, your weirdly first person and top down driving sims, your point and click adventures, and of course, your first and third person action shooters that we all know and love, or at least remember loving. Have have you have you played Goldeneye lately? It's uh Goldeneye, it really is not that great. It's super wonky and the controls suck. And look at Sean Bean's face! Oh my god! I will not be going through each game on the list, but it is important to talk about the creative methodology behind some of the more significant entries, what those games mean to players, and then where the next game in the series might take us. My first taste of James Bond through the veil of a console was, like many other people, 1997's GoldenEye 007 for the N64. Now, I didn't own an N64 when I was growing up, so my experience with the console was limited to going over friends' houses and then absolutely gorging myself on games like Super Mario, Mario Kart, Ocarina of Time, Lego Racers, Star Wars, Shadows of the Empire, and then eventually GoldenEye 007. At the time, my experience with first-person shooters was even more limited than my access to gaming consoles, and I actually think GoldenEye was the very first FPS I ever played. What I remember from my time with GoldenEye was that it was way more violent than anything I had ever played, but that violence wasn't necessarily visceral or bloody. It was arcadey and fun and fast-paced. Moving through corridors and crawling through vents with a silenced pistol and then blasting soldiers who, at the time, looked super realistic was wild to my then six-year-old brain. I didn't even know what James Bond was. I only knew that GoldenEye was something different than anything I'd ever played before and that it stuck out in my mind because of that. That happened a lot with the N64. This thing really did change the gaming paradigm for millions of people when it came out. And for all of the franchises and characters that Nintendo managed to embed into the psyche of players during its run, GoldenEye remains one of the definitive turning points in a franchise that has been full of them since its inception. We don't get that very often nowadays. Technology does not really jump literal dimensions when something new is announced. So when I say that the shift that the N64 created was actually something you could feel, I mean it. Weirdly, I never played GoldenEye's multiplayer much when I was a kid. The single player missions held my attention more than enough and I was probably a bit more selfish than I should have been because I knew my time was always gonna be limited by how long my friend would let me play before we switched over to something else. After 1997, the video game industry inched its way towards the awkward strangeness and rapid growth of the 2000s, and I inched my way towards the awkward strangeness and rapid growth of my own adolescence. So as the GameCube, the PS2, and the Xbox were being prepped to take the world by storm, a little publisher called Electronic Arts was making some serious headway into the next generation of James Bond video games. And in 2001, after producing three James Bond games for the N64, the PlayStation, and the Game Boy Color respectively, EA released the first of three games that helped to lay the groundwork for the franchise for the next four years. James Bond 007 Agent Under Fire is admittedly not the most amazing Bond game ever made. Its developer was EA Redwood Shores, but you might know them by their more popular name, Visceral Games. You know, makers of Dead Space, 
and Dante's Inferno, and Lord of the Rings Return to the King. Hey, um, can I, can I stop talking about James Bond games for a minute and just make a video about Return of the King as a game? Agent Under Fire feels a little bit more like a smorgasbord of ideas that were brought up through the concept phase, but then pushed out before they were fully baked. The idea of making a more cinematic experience for the players feels like it was at the forefront of development, and the presentation feels extremely geared toward fans of the Bond movies at the time, featuring everyone's favorite Bond, Pierce B. A lot of the missions in the game are only a few minutes long, and it creates a breakneck pace that doesn't leave a lot of padding for any emotional story beats or really any story beats. But there's enough heart and soul in the game, along with some pretty unique ideas to punch up the experience, such as varying the mission type from first person shooting to on rail shooting to driving alongside adding the much loved Bond moments into the mix. The mission structure feels a lot like mini set pieces from a Bond movie, which help the player don the mantle of James and is also beefed up by the always relevant early 2000s idea of puns and a little light misogyny. I don't know how to thank you. I'm sure we'll think of something. The bite-sized missions turned some players off from the more grounded, expansive shooters that were just beginning to pop up, but it allowed Redwood Shores to lay a path for themselves and other developers to follow and improve upon for the upcoming entries in the series. To be clear, Agent Under Fire wasn't on my personal list of favorite Bond games, but that's mainly because I never played it growing up. It wasn't until I started researching for this video that I finally tried my hand at it and the through line from it to the next two games I'm gonna talk about became abundantly clear very quickly. In fact, it became so clear to me that I made it my mission to find someone who actually worked on James Bond video games in the early 2000s. I wanted to ask them about the choices that they made during development, how the team's methodology was shaped, and what they remembered from their time working on a massive global franchise. And as luck would have it, someone actually answered my call. Sure, uh, I'm Wright Bagwell, I'm a game designer, and I, I've been designing games since the mid-90s or so. Spent a year at Valve working on pre-production for Half-Life 2. Then I went to EA to go work on James Bond games after that. I met Wright back in the Halcyon days of 2018, and when I finally sat him down for an interview, I told him that I wanted to know everything I could about the development of James Bond games, and to try and gain more insight into how someone goes about making a game based on a franchise like that. Needless to say, game development can be a pretty wild job, and Wright told me all about it. And at the time, EA was working on The World Is Not Enough. I arrived on the scene and I could tell this is kind of a disaster. <laughs> and the team was, was fairly dysfunctional. And I showed up and there were a lot of levels in production that were based on the, the film sets from Tomorrow Never Dies, or sorry, The World Is Not Enough. At that time, there was a feeling in the industry that when the PS2 came out, it was such a powerful console that developers would be able to hire talent from the film industry to help create more cinematic and detailed environments. By bringing talent from the film and animation industries, they would more easily be able to translate the cinematic qualities of the James Bond movies directly into the games. People thought, okay, well the future is 3D, we're going to have these incredibly powerful machines that can render super realistic graphics. Teams got larger, budgets got larger, and that's what was creating some of the you know dysfunction at EA. People weren't used to managing these really big, ambitious teams. Unfortunately, filmmaking tendencies don't mesh with game development as seamlessly as EA thought they would. Where filmmaking can be a more straightforward script-to-screen process, development on video games is often incredibly iterative and tedious. Gameplay mechanics become refined, systems are built, and then retrofitted to suit narratives that often shift based upon budget restrictions or expansions, and studio oversight can rapidly alter the focus of what developers are working on. We hit the reset button, and we stopped work on The World Is Not Enough, and we started making Agent Under Fire. So a brand new James Bond game that wasn't attached to any film. So we didn't have to worry about recreating movie sets or licensing specific characters or following any particular storyline. We could go do whatever we thought was going to make a great James Bond game. 
it, it you know took a, a, a big toll on a lot of people uh, but it also created some really deep friendships i think for a lot of us that was you know that was sort of our uh, you know soldiers in the trenches moment that formed a lot of deep friendships and sort of you know tested our abilities to work together and trust one another and we emerged as a really really strong team I asked Wright about the creation of several elements that have since become iconic for the EA-produced Bond games in the early 2000s, most notably the Bond moments. One of the people we brought on was Philip Campbell. He's an awesome guy who had, you know, a really diverse background in games and film. Um, and one of Philip's strengths is that he was fantastic at storyboarding, which of course was was perfect for, you know, I think what a lot of the management was looking for at the time. They wanted to sort of see, you know, show us how this can be cinematic, show us the villains, show us what the moments might look like and what emerged from this sort of new way of thinking about the game that we were building is that, yes, we wanted to have what were called bond moments. These Bond moments carried through to other James Bond games, and they grew and evolved and matured alongside the scope of development of those games. Agent Under Fire kind of feels like a testing ground for these types of moments, but as Nightfire and Everything or Nothing both started to take shape across EA's development teams, the cinematic tendencies grew to match those of the movie. During development, we, we built these moments and we were sort of rolling our eyes, just like, you know, really, this is... This is the best we can come up with is just like <laughs> use a grappling hook to, you know, to to avoid the front door. And when you did it, it would play the da 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 da. We were tired, working hard, and oftentimes we were coming up with ideas that just seemed so lame to us. So there, there was this sort of running joke on the team that anytime something kind of dumb happened in their game, <laughs> We would all just be like, da -da -da -da. so you know, it just became this sort of meme on the team as we were, you know, so tired and you know, burned out at times, and every bug or, or every just sort of poorly executed idea um, where we attempted to sort of make you feel like James Bond, you know, that we would just be like, da -da -da -da, all day, just sort of you shouting that over the cube walls to each other. There are so many moments that stick out in my mind as being particularly well done, like the driving sections at Nightfire and one absolute banger end sequence to a level in Everything or Nothing that has you base jumping out of a mine shaft, shooting enemies as you dive down to save your partner. I think Everything or Nothing turned out so well because that team did not want to sort of have those eye roll moments again, thinking about how do we make you feel like you're James Bond? How do we actually make you feel like you're actually cool and clever? There was a tremendous amount of effort put in in the first year of development to figure out, you know, what would make for a cinematic experience where you do feel like this, you've got these sort of, you know, superhero like powers. You know, James Bond takes massive risks and always sort of manages to pull them off. So yeah, leaping off of a cliff into a base jump. Yeah, so I think I think everything or nothing, those moments were, were born out of the fact that I think everyone was like a little embarrassed of, of, of Agent Under Fire. It wasn't a bad game by any stretch, but everyone knew that we could do much better. The evolution of these moments, and especially their presentation, can really be felt if you play through the games starting with Agent Under Fire all the way up to Everything or Nothing. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the multiplayer side of Nightfire and the co-op campaign of Everything or Nothing. Now, Nightfire was my brother and I's chosen gauntlet outside of Super Smash Bros., where our daily frustrations could be let loose with the thunderous sound of rapid gunfire and exploding missiles. Both of us replayed Nightfire's single-player campaign dozens of times, but our one true love was its multiplayer. Something about it just clicked for us both. But when Everything or Nothing came out, featuring the likenesses and voices of Piercy B, Heidi Klum, and Willem Dafoe, it marked a huge step up not just in its presentation, but also the amount of effort that EA was willing to put into making the game just as marketable as the movies were. The single player campaign is so much fun and honestly holds up fairly well to today's standards. I think every one of the reasons why Everything or Nothing I think did it so well is it didn't have the constraint of being tied to a movie. 
So it, it had the benefit of all the learnings from Agent Under Fire, but it still wasn't tied to any specific script. Um, so that gave us a lot of creative freedom, unlike, say, From Russia With Love, where, you know, we were trying to basically retell that that story. So I think those conditions tend to produce the best game designs. Hearing Wright explain the behind the scenes of some of my favorite games actually led me to go back and replay each of them. That nostalgic feeling was still bang on the money, and both Nightfire and Everything or Nothing feel and play great. Actually, I enjoyed replaying the game so much that I recruited my brother and my best friend to help out with this video. So what I did was I set up a small local session of Nightfire and let them both play a few rounds, and then I interviewed them about what they remembered from playing when we were all younger. Definitely a lot of nostalgia. It made me, it honestly made me feel, it made me notice how different games are now. Like there not being any sensitivity adjustment for the control sticks was like, wow, this was before that was even an issue. At that time we were just happy enough that you were aiming with one stick and moving with another stick. So yeah, nostalgia and holy crap, things were different back then. It's aged a, <laughs> a bit. Um, the controls feel like really sluggish when you're used to playing like a modern shooter. Um, you're like used to things being super responsive and you're like, oh wow, all right, I have to move as slow as the controller's moving. But um, still pretty fun as far as like, a, like playing with your buddies on the couch kind of multiplayer. In my opinion, Nightfire and Everything or Nothing both represent the pinnacle of what James Bond games reached. And it was all the way back in the early 2000s. Sure, there were other entries after that certainly represented the current state of James Bond as a film property at the time, but none of those releases ever reached the fun, cinematic, and unique take on the character that the earlier entries had. So, when developer IO Interactive announced in 2020 that their next project was a 007 one, I got really, really excited. As makers of the Hitman series, the team's pedigree really speaks for itself, and that series has always been likened to James Bond by fans, so it's not a stretch to see why they were chosen. I asked Cody and Jimmy what they thought about the game and what it needed to have in order to be a worthy successor to the ones that we played as kids. It's got to have the James Bond variety of cool gadgets, cool locations, cool weapons. That was one of the cool things about the games is that there was a, a variety of ways you could approach things, even back then when the games weren't nearly as sophisticated as they are now. I would definitely go less hokey just because I don't have like a connection to those as much. I do like all the gadgets, like I would want to have like a weird gadget like you were playing and pulled out a lighter and it was like, oh, it's a mini camera. Like stuff like that that's kind of like subtly thrown in. It's not like the core of the game is built around, but like little throwbacks like that would probably be cool. But like an overall more serious tone I think is probably the way to go to, especially because the current generation is, is would look at something like that a little bit as more uh, enticing. I think for a successful Bond game to work, it must marry the ideas of fun and varied gameplay, big emotional stakes, and unique takes on action set pieces that are the staples of the Bond films. And if it doesn't have all three of those, it has no chance of holding a candle up to Nightfire and everything or nothing. As a video game franchise, much like the movies, James Bond has its ups and downs. And some of them are pretty far down if I'm honest. Sorry, 007 Legends. But I've got faith that IO Interactive will pick up where Wright and the rest of the team left off and give us a well-made, unique take on the James Bond video game formula. Here's to hoping. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you made it to the end of this video, and also give us a follow on Twitch, twitch.tv slash subpixelteam. You will not regret it. We stream multiple days per week, and it's great. Like I said, it's well worth your time, unlike playing 007 Legends, which is a big pile of garbage. God, I'm so sorry. I hate that game so much. It's really bad. They wanted it to be good, but it wasn't. Okay. All right, I think I got it out of my system. All right, bye.